What's up, folks? So we're finally getting sports back into action. It's been long overdue, of course, since February, the pandemic and everything happening. NHL was suspended. NBA season was suspended. Major League Baseball was suspended. No one knew exactly what's going to happen, but at least now we're finally getting some sports back. So that is a good thing. And welcome, by the way, to the very first episode of Broad Street South Sports Talk. I am your host, Angel. I'm going to have on my co-host here in a little bit, Mike Fuji. We're going to be talking Eagles, Phillies, Flyers, if I can remember correctly, and a couple of things as well. The Jalen Hurts, of course, saga has been here, and maybe Colin Kaepernick being added to the squad, so who knows? But all that will be coming up shortly, right after this. All right, to just give you a little rundown here, obviously we're going to be talking a little in-depth more as far as when it comes to the Eagles. We're talking about their schedule Jason Peters coming back to the team. Again, Colin Kaepernick looking like he may become an Eagle here shortly because the Eagles have interest as much as Kaepernick has interest as well in Philadelphia. So could that be controversial? Who knows? Because the only thing that Philly's looking at about saying what uh, Harry Roseman was talking about a little while ago was having the quarterback factory here in Philadelphia. So no one knows. But overall, at least we're seeing signs of sports coming back. And at this point, this is where I can juice introduce my co-host mike fuji who's up in the gray northeast so without further ado i'm bringing on mike fuji hey, hey mike how are you good angel how you doing today so far so good can't complain things could be worse so I, i'll take it with a grain of salt oh got sports back in the city you probably really love starting the night with the phil's the uh, Baltimore Orioles. Which is, if you look at, and we'll go into a little bit later on as far as the Philly schedule, it's the condensed version is so weird because it, you have basically like the, the Blue Jays, I know we play a bunch of times and normally we don't. Uh, the Yankees, we play a, a couple extra times and I know that we don't. And I guess the way they're trying to do is the travel is what they're looking at. They I guess they say within, like, it, I guess looks like the Northeast for the most part, unless – if Toronto has to come to Florida, that'll be interesting with the Phillies because I know they will travel down here with the Marlins, but I'm wondering how much they're going to be able to fluctuate the schedule and if, obviously, if the season will continue going because who knows? There's still players that are testing positive. Some players obviously don't want to play. Some of them have opted out, which they won't get paid for the season, and yeah, that's their choice. I can understand if they don't want to bring that stuff home to their families, but there's a lot of things that are going to happen. That It's going to be interesting as the weeks to come to see how it's all going to play out. But it's going to be just as weird. If you've been noticing, like on ESPN, and I think they've been the only ones so far that have shown the broadcast games where there's no fans in the stands as well. But when the broadcasters are talking, it's not about the game. It's most like everything else in between, which is, it seems weird. And that's what's probably going to end up happening with Major League Baseball as well because you don't have that fan interaction where oh. they can look in the stands and say, hey, look what so-and-so is doing. So all this is going to be brand new to everybody. Well, absolutely, because, you know, when, you know, fans in the stands, you know, are always flashing the camera on, you know, people, you know, eating or some type of commotion going on. And as you uh, talk about the Toronto Blue Jays, I heard that, you know, Canada said, don't come here, you know. Yeah. Because they said their minor league team in uh, Buffalo, they may have to play their games up there, too, so. Well, supposedly the funny thing is, as you're talking about Buffalo, is that coming today over uh, apparently a couple of articles and again on, on the local uh, TV stations was that apparently for the Blue Jays to play in Buffalo, apparently the night games, the stadium isn't lit too well. So they would have a lot of darkened areas. So if you're right. catching a fly ball, I mean, it could be a good possibility of either getting one to the head or you're just putting the glove over your head, hoping that you don't end up getting hit. So. It, that within itself for Toronto is going to be tough, extremely tough, but I'm pretty sure they'll be able to pull it out. Sounds like the old days of Wrigley Field before the lights, you know, that got put up in, I think it was like 1988 or something. Yeah, well, you got, and then what they played, if we all remember, is about one o'clock games, three o'clock games, and it was definitely way before nightfall. And then if, obviously yeah. if it rained, then it was one of those things where they had to, uh, but when I'm looking for, they had to postpone it for the next game, which right. back then when you and I were kids, the beautiful thing was a doubleheader because you played for one game, but you go watch two. Right. Well, I remember one time they were playing the Phillies or Chicago, 
playing the Cubs, and I guess it was getting not real dark, but they suspended the game till the next day. Yeah. yeah. It, and a lot of the stuff, it, it's going to be so much interesting. The same way with the NFL, because the NFL now has chosen to start the regular season on time. It doesn't mean that every team is, is supposed to be starting, but they have given the green light to the teams to start practicing, go into facilities. The Buccaneers, of course, they've been practicing – in their facility, but also before that, Tom Brady was out around Tampa Bay and the different areas trying to practice with his team members. And I guess there was nothing wrong with that. With I'm pretty sure uh, other teams as well have done the same exact thing. Now, when they go back, which everyone hopes that it will be a season, again, it comes down to whether the fans are going to be letting the stands, if they're going down to 1,000, 25%, nothing. Who knows? Right. You know, they – being a season ticket holder with the Eagles, I deferred my tickets, you know, this past earlier in the week. And, you know, now at the city, they're in the state, they're not sure whether they're going to have 25% fans in the stands or no fans at all. I just think it's up to each state government what they want to do as far as each team in the NFL. Exactly. But I'm going to bring up a slide here real quick. And it shows, obviously, the 32 teams will commence previously as possible, scheduled to July 28th. So that is the inception date right now that everyone is looking for. And it could be a possibility that it does happen. Again, who knows, because things are going to go, they're going to fluctuate. The weirdest thing that I did here, which makes no sense to me, is that they're, so they're going by and saying that, let's just say the Eagles, for example, have a game out in Arizona. So they would have to board the plane at about 2, 3 in the morning take the six hour flight to Arizona practice, do like their, their normal routine. They would do that day, play a four o'clock game, be finished with the game, shower up all the good fun stuff, get back on the bird and come back to Philly. So you're almost talking about a full 24 hour day that these guys would run through. And then you're also talking about doing, you know, so you would have, let's just say the next day off, but what happens if it's a Sunday night, let's just say hypothetically, and then your next game is on Thursday and you're traveling both games. So it, it makes for an interesting situation. And I know they're trying to do the best that they can. The commissioner, I guess, Dr. Fauci, the CDC. I mean, everyone's trying to do whatever they possibly can to bring everyone together. But I don't know how much is going to work. That's true. I mean, that's, that's a great analogy that you say because, you know, Sunday to Thursday games especially, you know, no, you know, how can these guys practice in between there, you know, especially with the social distancing and, you know, 53-man rosters, I think, will be updated or expanded. And just keeping, you know, coaches, trainers, players, like, all separated and stuff. Right. I mean, it's, I think the NFL's got a big mountain to climb as far as trying to keep everybody, you know, testing them three times a week, which I think the protocol is going to be. Yeah. Which I, think said, I think they said something where – if a player does test positive, they are going to automatically go on the injured reserve. That's what I, I keep hearing. I guess the same way with the NBA. Like the NBA, I guess, are because – and that's a whole different horse, a whole different nature too. Because So the NBA is trying their best to test these guys every day when they come out from – which they don't have far to travel. You're talking about going from the Disney compound, the practice compound, back right. to the room, back to the compound. And it's just small travels back and forth. Unfortunately, with that, is that the guys are getting nuts because they're getting like, like rations, like kids get, you know, right. in school. Yeah. Right? It's, yeah. Like, so now you have the guys that are getting out of the bubble because they can't stand anymore. They want real food and they want stuff that's going to be filling. So, it, it this, if I don't know how it's going to work with the NFL. They keep saying that maybe they're going to they're going to do a tight bubble, but I don't know how much that's going to fly. I mean, these guys are used to just going out dinner and hanging out after the games and stuff and just going from there. Like, you know, you're going to be playing a game and then what are you going to do? Like, it's like being on curfew. <laughs> exactly. Grown well, men just, you know, some guys just want to go out and party and, you know, do their thing. And I guess they're just not used to being confined. Yeah. Well, it, it's all, like I said, it, it, there's so much that's going to be digested throughout the year. Who knows? I mean, I know, for example, the, the group that I that I associate myself with, which is a fun group, and I'll bring it up here real quickly here, that you have 
affiliate itself and, and a great fun fan organization. I mean, we have a lot of fun when, when we get together as a group. There's, um, I can't even, if you were here, it, you would see it because it's just like everyone that we've, that's been in Philly or Jersey or Delaware, somewhere in the surrounding Northeast area. And even fans who were born here, which were surprising to know that there's a lot of Eagles fans from down here itself. Right. The good thing is that when we get together, I mean, it, it's a fun time. You cheer, you root, you do everything you do back in Philly, minus some fights maybe. But there's no fights where when we end up hanging out. But the, the fun part is even with us trying to get together this year and for me to try and do a podcast from uh, the establishment that we're going to be at this year, it's going to be tough because, again, you're, you're going down to 25 percent. Who knows? Maybe after Election Day, they'll, everything will back up to 100 percent. All of a sudden, magically, all this stuff will be gone. So who knows the way the government works because it is an election year. We have to look at it that way as well. But it's going to be interesting because we may not even have a place to watch the games other than home. So if you don't have, you know, some sort of dish or direct TV package, I mean, who's to say that you're going to be able to watch the game? So there's, I don't know, I, again, there's there's a lot of things that are, that are going to happen, maybe not going to happen. Who the heck knows? But all right. we're all just going to play by ear. But. Speaking of signings and everything else, we also, of course, we had Jason Peters, who was signed back for one year, six million dollar contract. Three million of that money is guaranteed, which I found even more interesting. And he's going to have an annual base salary of six million dollars, of course, because well, that's the one year deal that he received. So, one year, six mil, three million guaranteed. What are your thoughts? Hey, it was a good move. I mean, honestly, I don't think Jason Peters is going to play right guard. I mean, I think uh, Matt Pryor is going to step in. I mean, I just think it's a backup plan in case still Andre Dillard doesn't can't step up to the plate and you know be the new bodyguard for Carson Wentz. You know, I just, I mean, I do have some depth on the line. A couple guys that you have drafted, right? And like I said, I just think it's. Maybe smoke and mirrors of Jason Peters will play left tackle again, if need be. Yeah. The funny, interesting thing here, and, and the one thing, of course, one person who I follow extremely close, which would be my brother back home, James Seltzer, and he was talking about on his Go Birds podcast, and they mm -hmm. may be renaming their podcast, but him and uh, Elliot Shore Parks were going back and forth, and it was interesting because one of their uh, – Elliot Shore Parks has sent out a tweet saying that, he wanted to hear back from the fans. Like, do they have a question that they can have on air with them? I thought the most interesting question was that a fan called in or obviously sent a tweet out saying that if Jason Peters would finish up either on the injury list, finish up the season, or ended up as a backup. And it's true because you take a look at it. I mean, Jason Peters is getting up there as far as of age, so his gameplay may not be too well. And if we look at it, within the last two seasons, I mean, he hasn't played an entire season. So is there going to be something that obviously with the Eagles, could they bring someone else on board? Or will Jason Peters, or you were saying like prior, will he end up taking over the position? Because I don't see him finish out the entire season. I would like to, but I don't think he'll finish out the entire season. It's hard to say. I mean, 38 years old, two Achilles injuries and an ACL on his – on his knee and you know, back issues like, you know, the weight as you get older, the weight of, you know, it's a lot on your legs, especially your knees. You know, it's, you know, JP's, he's a warrior, but, you know, I think, I think it's time my ad passed. I hope I'm wrong and I hope I eat my words, but I guess you can't go wrong as a safety blanket for Andre Dillard. That is true. That is so true. But, I mean, you, we, we haven't been able to talk, obviously, a lot of sports because it, it's, it has been – it's been discussed, but I, I think at this point no one has really broken down a lot of tape. I mean, you look at the, the wide receivers we picked up during a draft. You look at Jalen Hurts, and Jalen Hurts, by the way, has some fantastic numbers when it comes to college. He did, I think, uh, an outstanding job when it comes to the Sooners. Uh, you're talking about down in Alabama. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that – he can bring to this team, and, and he may have to wait his time out a little bit because obviously Nate Sudfield is supposed to be the one groomed for in case Carson Wentz goes down. Now, I would like to see, obviously, a challenge between Jalen Hurts 
and Nate Sudfield because I think it would make it better for at least competitively, even for Carson Wentz to see how much he's learned within the three to four years he's been with the Eagles organization and what can he do to improve his game. Oh, um, you're right because you know Hertz has all these great tools, but I mean Nate Sudfeld's been here three or four years, and it's like I don't know what the guy's really. I know he really hasn't been able to show anything with Carson Wentz, but for some reason they love Nate Sudfeld. They've held on to him for a reason. I mean, I know a couple of years ago the Redskins got rid of him and the Eagles picked him up, I believe, as a free agent or off waivers. But yeah, it's you know it's a good raises a good point. No, it's again many. Just the I don't know if you want to call the many different flavors, the, the different things that that'll end up happening. I know I like to see how how he says how this whole quarterback factory is going to happen. I thought it was interesting, just as interesting if we go way back many years when someone called us what the, the what was the the words they put together. Basically, the best team of all time. The dream team back in the, the dream team. There you go. So. I know if, if, if you're making a comparison, and obviously we, we do have at quarterback that right now, it's looking pretty good. Now, of course, the rumor has been as well is that apparently Colin Kaepernick will love to come to Philly, supposedly. And who knows? This could be rumors. It could be some validity to it. But there has been people that have checked out Colin Kaepernick as well as some of his workouts. But I think it was previous other than the one that he had staged down there in Georgia. So would I like to see Colin Kaepernick in Philly? I, I think it will be a, a great addition to this quarterback journey that the Eagles going to go through. You know, whatever he's got going on as far as, you know, personal in his life, he's going to keep, you know, pursuing, you know, whether it's a movement, whether it's just Colin Kaepernick himself. And I'm not even going to talk about on that behalf because that's something that Colin Kaepernick will have to address with everyone else. But I think coming on board, he knows what the Philly mentality is. He knows this will be another chance for him to pretty much, you know, show what he had because the last time we saw him was during the Ravens. And Niners, as far as that Super Bowl, we know the Ravens ended up winning that one. I believe he played one more year before the 49ers decided, you know, cut ties with him. But I think, if anything, hopefully he's – we know that obviously this first statement that he made by kneeling down, a lot of people may not have understood it when he did it during the National Anthem. And some people will still argue saying that he shouldn't have done it during, during the National Anthem. But my thing is, if, if that was how he was going to bring this point across, then that was up to Colin Kaepernick in the NFL. I mean – we can talk about it till, you know, the end of the world. But my thing is that I think if you're going to have people coming on board and they're going to see, you know, what's he all about, then showcase his talents. Don't talk about it as far as much movements and stuff that he's doing, but more showcase his talents so he can help this organization out because it, they would need a big boost because Carson Wentz, I would love to see him play a 16-game regular season and then go into the playoffs. Or let's just say hypothetically, which is, of course, a far stretch, but let's say we go 14-0 which would be the best record we've ever had with the, with the Eagles. So you go 14-0, you give them a break for the last two weeks, and then make sure that your other quarterbacks are in tune and they, make, they, they know exactly what's happening, what, you know, what their deal is. It's a great point. I mean, I think Kaepernick would have some, you know, veteran experience that the Eagles really don't have. And, you know, I'm sure Nate Sudfeld and Jalen Hurts could learn from him. I mean, like you said, he got the – the 49ers to the Super Bowl in 2012 against the Ravens. I mean, they almost pulled it out. I think mean, he still has a lot to prove to himself. I mean, that's the, obviously the, the, the big move in there is that he does have a lot to prove to himself. I think, can he get the job done? I believe so. It's just on how much. And again, you always, it's like everything else. When, when you go to work, you got your work family, you got the people that you may like, you may not like. When you come home, you have your family. You know, they're not your work family. They're your actual family. So when you're coming back to the NFL, if, if they're going to – and it works both ways because, you know, Kaepernick, is, he's not hurting for anything whatsoever. He still has a humongous deal with uh, with Nike. So it's not like he needs to rush to come back. Now he can make his, his judgment call where he wants to go. But if you are going to come back, you are going to have to separate, you know, whatever you want to say, and it's it's up to him. It's a free country. He can say whatever he wants to. But when it comes down to fundamentals of football, you got to make sure that if you're going to be a leader – it starts on the field and forward. All right. Exactly. So, and adding a little bit of the controversy, of course, the next guy is d -Jax. He was fined by the organization because he made an anti-Semitic tweet that obviously did not bode well with the Jewish community. 
and with everything again that's going on currently, probably not the smartest thing that he did. But the one thing I will say, and we were talking about this earlier, is that I don't think that Deshaun knew exactly what he was tweeting out because, and, and again, it's going to be, I'm pretty sure, arguments. People are going to make the case for it. You know, again, bringing my brother up, James Seltzer, beforehand, he talked about it. He was obviously hurt because he is Jewish. And, and for people who don't know that, you know, it, it's almost kind of living on the rock. But, you know, he was hurt by the comments. And Deshaun said he's going to do everything he possibly can to make himself better and educate himself a lot more. So he's going out to Auschwitz, um, go learn from and educate himself on what the Jewish community had to go through to get to where they are today. And, of course, the, the fine that was imposed by the Eagles Deshaun also said that he's going to turn that money and put it to a local organization. I haven't heard from here if he's put it towards the organization or if he's named it or not. But Deshaun, you know, it might be cut and ties. It may not. But again, it's going to be a season to tell. Oh, correct. I mean, you know, like you're saying about, you know, I don't think you've realized what he was saying either. And Julian Edelman reached out, you know, his hand about, you know, they would go to the, Holocaust Museum, and then they would go to the African American Museum and sit down and have a burger and, you know, talk about it. Right. I thought it was great by Julian Edelman, and I believe Deshaun reached out and accepted him. It's, I think it's, you know, again, and, and that's everybody. It's you and I, everyone included. The, the, the big thing is, obviously, as we're humans, we're going to make a mistake. Everyone knows this. We don't, you know, there's, I, and I can speak for myself sort of when it comes to opinions, but you know, you, there may not be such a thing as a perfect marriage, a perfect relationship, you know, anything perfect. If, if we were, and I've always said this to my own family members, if we were, we wouldn't be here. We'd be up in heaven because it, it doesn't get much more perfect than that. We all got flaws and we all got a history. Right. So I think when Deshaun came back, truthfully, he wanted to come back. And, and I know when he, when he was leading up to his press conference, and I can't remember that just like it was yesterday, a lot of people were saying, well, there's the Sean, classic the Sean, because I even said it myself, but no one was thinking that obviously he was still talking to Harry Roseman right. inside the link before he came up on stage. So it was one of those things that a lot of us had to eat crow. I'm like, whoops, you know, we thought the Sean was going back to his old way, but come to find out he was just held back and not realizing that the conference had already started. Well, but my I think, opinion, no, I didn't mean to call you off. No, no, you're fine. But I, I just think. It, it's going to be a major learning curve. It, it's going to be a learning right. curve where he, again, when he decided to come back with the team, he knew what was at stake. And and I understand that Chip Kelly, which none of us can stand us in, in his town, Chip exactly. Kelly really ruined a lot. And again, of course, this could be like an open chapter because if Chip Kelly didn't do what he, what he did do, what we have our first Super Bowl championship. So it, it's just, all this ties in in weird ways that but always wish we just had a, a you know a crystal ball and say poof here's what's gonna happen in the future but it, I, i'm pretty sure deshaun will get better all right i mean to me chip kelly was just an ass i mean traded mccoy for kiko alonzo caught deshaun basically for nothing just to me it's just a straight up moron <laughs> i'm sure a lot of people would agree to that too yeah, I think as well. But this is uh, this kind of brings me to the point here where I'm going to end up doing the uh, – what's the word I'm looking for here? I'm going to be bringing on, I guess, the, the schedule. That that's the word I was trying to look for because, once again, it's, it's sometimes you get a brain fart. But we're looking at the schedule, and, of course, we're going to, we're going to take a look at the schedule and looking from week one up to the bye week. Again, if this does happen, and in that – you know, within the schedule – we're going to see that, you know, what's the travels so far. And I, I believe San Fran, like I said, we got to go out to the West Coast. So who knows how all this is going to happen. But I'm going to bring up the schedule here so we can take a look and see what you think, you know, who's going to end up taking it, who's not going to take it. And, you know, it, it's just it's going to be quite interesting. So we take a look at, at week one here. And if I bring it a little more forward, you got, of course, us against – the Redskins in DC. Now, of course, they're not the Redskins anymore. Now they're just the Washingtonians. Who knows? Right. I think they're they're throwing around the idea they're going to be the Red Tails. There's other controversial things that go along with the you know former Redskins. Dan Snyder's in you know in, in a lot of hot water. There's so right. many things that are going wrong with this organization that when originally when I was looking at the schedule, 
I, I would almost say with Ron Rivera trying to prove a point that he was going to come busting out the gates on week one. Now knowing what's been happening with this organization, I'm going to go with obviously the Eagles to, to go for the win for this one with week one. I, I agree because that, that organization's in shambles already. It's just, it's a dumpster fire. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be, you know, we, we don't, you don't want to talk about certain things obviously because you don't, you don't know what the end result would end up being, but we're going to get into that one just a little bit later on. It's just a, the Redskins organization, it's just it's one of those things that they, they've never been able to get a grasp. And it seems like the last 15 years, they've gone so far backwards. And, and you look at Jay Gruden as a coach. Jay Gruden was not the end-all to be-all, and it proved that in D.C. Ron oh. Rivera, personally, was a surprising move by the Carolina Panthers to get rid of him and then him coming over to the Redskins. And I, and I know they're you know the Panthers are trying to say they're reorganizing, they're trying to do different things when it comes to organization. But Ron Rivera, I think, will be – Give it a little bit of time. I think he will be more of a beast in the East than Mike McCarthy with the Cowboys. Oh, I think Ron Rivera is a great coach. I mean, got the Carolina Panthers to the Super Bowl four or five years ago. You know, he was, you know, was assistant under a linebackers coach under Randy Reid. He played for Buddy Ryan and, you know, the Bears defense. You know, just, I think he's just one. Probably one of the most underrated coaches in football. Yeah, I would have to agree. I mean, but it's a shame, you know, maybe Doug could have brought him on as a defensive coordinator if we didn't have um, Jim Schwartz. But I think he's yeah. one of the better defensive minds in the game today. Right. That's, the, that's one of those things you bring up Jim Schwartz. I mean, to cut you off of that, that would be one of those things. You know, in Madden, you can bring back, like, you know, classic players and everything else. If we could bring back Jim Peters, or good Lord, <laughs> see, this is where I get all the names all mixed up here. If we can bring back Johnson, the best part would be that you would have the most explosive defense ever. So even if you played on a pro level and you end up beating yourself, that would be great to bring back on a Madden feature, but I don't see it happening. Oh, well, I agree. Another guy that was another defensive genius was Bud Carson with the 91 Eagles. I mean, it's that's true. But Buddy assembled that defense and, you know, they kicked ass. But, you know, Bud Carson, you know, guys like Seth Joyner, Reggie, Clyde Simmons, Eric Allen all love Bud Carson and respected him just as much as Buddy Ryan. This is very true. But if we take a look here now, of course, come week two, we've got the L.A. Rams that looks like the Chargers because it's weird how they end up putting all these helmets and everything else together. But if you take a look at it, right. that would be week two, and that's back here in Philadelphia. So I, it, this first of all, the new look and 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 or you know Rams, whatever they they it, the, I don't know. I, I'm not a super fan of all the stuff they're trying to do. I guess they're going more high tech. I am dying to see though with that brand new stadium and the, the amount of money they're going to pour into it. The same way with the Las Vegas Raiders this year, but I with when it comes to the Rams, I I think the Eagles can pull off that win as well. So I, I think that would be at least start the season off at two and zero. I agree. I mean, I think the Rams are they're not the same team they were a couple of years ago. I mean, Ty Girl, he was you know he's moved on to Atlanta. You know they traded a uh, Brandon Cooks. You know it's just. You know, I, Jared Goff to me is a fraud. I mean, I'm not sold on the guy, but yeah, but neither am I. I just think the Eagles should, you know, just wipe them up. Not a blow. But I just yeah, think Sean, I think too. Hurt. If if you take a look at it, Sean McVay still hasn't proven a lot of things. Well, he, you you can't go to Super Bowl and then be exposed. And and. All right. I mean, he was – that was probably the worst you've ever seen a team being exposed. And the worst time to do it is obviously during the Super Bowl. That's what happened to the Patriots the year they went, what, 16-0 and during the regular season? And then they met the Giants in the Super Bowl because, remember, they, they – you know, the Giants end up almost beating them during the regular season, but they waited until they get to the Super Bowl to beat them in the Super Bowl. So, right. and, and no offense to Patriots fans, but I'm glad the Dolphins record and Don Chula – the late Don Chula, I'm glad that record is still intact because 
no one should maybe okay i'll take that back the eagles i'd be happy if they actually did that where an undefeated season a perfect season i would love that but it's far stretch but one never knows right now the next one we look at here week three one o'clock game again we're home against the cincinnati bengals who they have brand new quarterback they have you know again issues going on in cincinnati there's a lot of uncertainty. They got a brand new head coach going on over there. So I don't see Cincinnati being any kind of a factor, which I, I'll give the win to the Eagles for obvious reasons. But I think Cincinnati, like a few teams, maybe like the Cleveland Browns, I would say are still probably six to seven years away from getting to what they want to establish in the team. So if you're going to start rebuilding, you might as well do it now because the fan base really isn't showing up. Oh, I, to me, it's an automatic win. I mean, that. The team's just, I don't know what's wrong with that organization. I mean, Marv Lewis was probably there maybe five, six years too long, you know, before they fired him. Right. Uh, but he believed a lot in him. So, that, I mean, you can't take that away from Marvin Lewis as well. I mean, he did such an excellent job with the Ravens. And, and I'm pretty oh, sure right. Marvin Lewis will come back at, at one point or another in his career. But, you know, who's to say? And that, and they kind of, in a weird way, again, as, as we're looking at current issues, like how they were saying that the, the NFL is trying to make incentives, like, you know, you know put the, you know, if you put in, uh, if you hire a black coach and a black GM, basically you would move up as far as the scale when it comes to picks. Um, it, it, I didn't like that when he said it originally. One thing is that I think if, if you're the best man qualified for a job, regardless of whatever your ethnicity is, then you should be making that now. On the other hand, should there be more black coaches? Should be more black people in the front office? Yeah, with, without a doubt, because there's a lot of them that have been held back. Now, some may be because they haven't learned their job as much, but others because they have been they have been qualified. And and who's to say? Because it's everywhere you go, there's a good old boy system, and it could be a possibility that you know so and so could be moved up to that position, but because they already had someone in mind, just like you do in an interview in a regular job in the outside world. It's a reason why they're, they're they were held back. But I, Marvin Lewis, I, if he doesn't come back as a head coach, I would love to see him in a front office somewhere, preferably even back with the Ravens in their front office. All right, I totally agree with you there. But so now we look at Week Four. So we're halfway at least through the first half of the season, and we have the Niners. And the Niners last year were pretty pretty explosive, minus of course the end of year what ended up turning out, but. This is where we make the travel to the West Coast. Now, mind you, this game is at 820. And if we go back to what I said earlier, if you're looking at it, this will be an 820 game. You're looking at at least about 1130, 1145 East Coast time by the time the game is over. So add, you know, the three hour difference by the time the Eagles come back. You know, let's just say after the media, if they're allowed to talk, if they're going to be in the locker room, you're looking at the Eagles coming back probably close to at least four, maybe even five in the morning, you're getting the day off and then you got to go back to practice come Tuesday. So this is where it's going to get interesting. But as far as this game here, this is kind of a 50-50 toss up for me. I, I have the feeling that the Eagles can beat San Fran, but I'm not going to take away from San Fran because of what they accomplished last year. And of course, you know, it's a new season. So who's just saying? This one, it might be my first loss, and it'll come against San Fran. I got to say, I got to agree with you there because, you know, San Fran was close to pulling out that game against Kansas City in the Super Bowl. And, you know, got a lot of talent on that team just with Garoppolo. And, you know, it's a hell of a defense. Right. Hell of a team. John Lynch put together. He's done. A, he's done a fantastic job. I mean, you can't you, you can't take over for the 49ers organization because you look at. It, I mean, for years those guys had struggled even to get back to where they are. Garoppolo. Exactly. I mean, that that was. I understand Tom Brady was butthurt back in the day with the Patriots because obviously it, it, he knew the time was coming. Would Garoppolo have been a better fit with the Patriots right now? Yes. Now they have Cam Newton. Can Cam Newton stay healthy enough? and of mind and soul to finish up the entire season. Because again, 
You know, all we hear is what goes on with Bill Belichick, but no one will ever know until obviously you arrive in New England. So that's going to be interesting with himself. Can Cam Newton, you know, fall into that design pattern? Do I see the Patriots going back to the Super Bowl? Not a chance in hell. I don't no. see it. You know, it, I think with Tom Brady being gone, it, it's a whole different scenario. So I, I don't see that one. But this one I, I will not give to the Eagles. I think that would be the first loss. So right now we're looking at three and one. And of course, the next one coming up will be the Battle of the Pennsylvania States because after that we've got the Steelers again in Pittsburgh. So add the travel. This time would only be, of course, in state. But the Steelers, to me, this one I take as a win for the Eagles because I just don't see the, you know, I don't see Pittsburgh doing much of anything again this year. They're still working with Ben Roethlisberger. He swears he's going to be changed. He's going to be a lot better. Again, time will tell as he, now training camp will start, but I just think, you know, Ben doesn't have really much left in the tank. No, nah, totally not. I think he's at the end of the line. I mean, they don't – to me, I don't think they really even have a, you know, backup that's waiting in the wings for him. I know the last couple of years they drafted a couple guys, but it doesn't seem like, you know, nobody – not a, not that you need a big name, not that they're always the uh, – yeah, you know, a slam dunk, but I don't think they. Uh, I don't, you know, I think, still think Pittsburgh's, you know, got to rebuild. Yeah, he let Antonio Brown go last year, and you know they just went backwards. And that's why you talk about another guy who's just full of controversy. Holy moly, that's a that's a different show for a whole different day because Antonio Brown. I really hope he's really just humbled himself enough because. He, the, well, he took a turn for the worst, but it was Antonio's fault. Not no one else's, but Antonio's fault. So that one, that one, it's kind of one of those leave it alone because we'll wait to see what what's the next chapter in Antonio Brown's uh, career. But then you look at now week six, one o'clock game. We're back home against the Ravens. Again, the Ravens had a phenomenal year last year. But what did they do? They didn't think the Titans were for real. And the Titans came into town and proved yeah, you know what? We're going places. So this one, again, it's one of those 50-50 toss-ups. Mm -hmm. And this one, I may not go with the Eagles as well. This one, I think I'll leave it alone and just still keep it at four and two. Oh, I'm going to beg the differ. Call me crazy. I'm not being a homer. I just, you know, if, if the Eagles, you know, can just show up and – Come to play, I think they could beat the Ravens. I think it's a close game. I think they probably pulled out by a field goal. It's not going to be a runaway or anything. Right. I think, you know, if, give Wentz enough time to get the ball out and the defense steps up to shut down Lamar Jackson, they can win. Then they could. I agree there. Now, the next one. Well, I'll just listen. This is an easy no-brainer. It's just a win. I don't care which one. And, and come the second half of the season, it's still yet another win when we have to travel to New York. The only difference is, obviously, it's an 820 game coming up on a right. Thursday night. So, And then, of course, there's a short and span week because then they have the Sunday night game. So, And, again, it, it's going to be – the only good thing is that, obviously, it's home and home, so it's not too bad. But the Giants – the Giants have so much to put together. That team is just as much as disarray, not as bad as the Redskins, but they still have so much to, to grow and learn, especially with this new young quarterback. I say win, but the Eagles, for whatever reason, in the NFC East, they just, I mean, no matter how bad the talent is, as you saw last year, they just let teams hang around. And, they, you know, instead of, like, keeping the gas on the pedal and blowing them out, you know, they let these teams hang around. And right. I mean, you know, like, I, I predict the win myself. But, you know, the Giants and the Redskins, you know, what you're going to get out of them this year. But still, you know, it's an NFC East rivalry. And, you know, the rivalries, I mean, teams just play each other, you know, the best they can just because of the rivalries are so old and, you know, it's back and forth like a heavyweight fight. Right. 
no matter the record. Or and the it's so true. But when you take it now, you look at week eight, which is the, the week before the bye week. And, I, and I'm, again, this is one of those things if you're happy that the bye week comes late in the season versus early. Because if, if and I hope that we minimize the injuries this year, just like every NFL team. But if you take a look at at least with having the bye week in the middle of the season, that's, I mean, it does wonders. Because if you do have someone who got injured, let's say week one, we hope not. But maybe they can come back by the second half of the season. So that I like at least that the, the cards fall in the favor for the Eagles on at least having a late bye week. Now, we're looking at week eight, Sunday night game against Dallas, which now uh, for some reason their running back, Ezekiel Elliott, has to come on and say, look at my numbers, blah, blah, blah. That's been a hot topic of the week, along with Dak Prescott, obviously, who I'm starting to feel more and more that Dak, and, and I know it goes both ways, don't get me wrong. I know that Dak and the Cowboys have to see eye to eye in order to, to be able to come together with a contract. I know Dak is also looking at what Patrick Mahomes just received, but you got two major differences. Patrick Mahomes, no offense, by far right now the best quarterback in the NFL. In order to uh, Dak to get to that level, I mean, he's got to really step up his game, and he just signed a one-year tender, which is going to cost Dallas, if I remember correctly, $30 million. And if he signs another tender next year, it's $37 million to so go get out of the Cowboys. I don't think that Dak will stay with the Cowboys. For this game, I'm going to go with the Eagles, even though I think Mike McCarthy maybe, maybe do well. He's still got a lot of rebuilding with that team. But I come the second half of the season, if we blow this game – and we know the season on the schedule come later on during the year. I'm pretty sure the Eagles will take it, but I'm still believing that the Eagles will win this game. I'm going to go the other way because it'll be a close game, but I just think Dallas pulls it out. I'm sure I'll probably take heat for saying that. But um, my perspective of it, going back to the draft, I just wish Howie would have traded up to get C.D. Lamb. Yeah. And, no, you know, no disrespect to Jalen Rieger, but, I mean, C.D. Lamb just being a slam dunk to this, you know, this Carson Wentz could have used for years. They could have. And I think it's between that also, um, if you look at DeAndre Hopkins, how do you pass on DeAndre Hopkins? Perfect. Perfect example. I mean, I mean it, the Eagles really didn't give much up for him. No, they sure didn't. And, and I'm pretty sure he had interest here in Philly as well. Like, I, I don't understand how in the world such a great, first of all, a phenomenal human being for what he does for his mom. And right. God bless his mother, you know, unfortunately what she had to endure in her younger years. But, I mean, the, the man goes above and beyond. And how could you not have that in, in this organization? You know, just as a person alone. But, you know, again, exactly. you and I are not in the front office. So, who knows what the Eagles decide to do there? It's just, to me, it's incredible. But, again, who in the world knows? There, right. There's going to be so much to learn from that behalf. And I mean, I don't know. I'll give Fowey credit where it's due, but then you shake your head. It's just, to me, Howie can't. I don't think he's that good of drafting. Never did. No. I mean, it's just, you go back, you look at um, some of these – Picks. What was his name? Smith from Louisville. Yep. And Danny Watkins, and you know, just some players they could have had. That, you know, you just shake your head at like, like it's a great capologist. Yeah, he got got us the Super Bowl, but still, you gotta shake your head at some of the moves that he does. Correct. I mean, yeah. Just, I think, obviously, he's – if I would have to say that Howie Roseman may be looking at the outside in at this point versus where he's inside right now, right. you guys start thinking that there, there's going to be changes coming up with his organization. This year might be just kind of like a wash year just because, obviously, there's still, again, a lot of unknowns that the season's going to start. I mean, they can go to you know training camp right now, but it doesn't mean that it can come to a grinding halt. So this year, Howie might end up getting – a pass, excuse me. But there's not to say that obviously come next year, he may not be around. Well, going into next year with this year being up in the air, I mean, the Eagles are $50 million over the cap. 
Larson Wentz's new contract that he signed last year kicks in. And, you know, there's a lot of players that are already being paid a lot of money. Right. I mean, you could – you could probably see some of the core of this team be gone. The way you've had, you know, from the Super Bowl year to now. Right. There's been constant turnover, but, you know, I think Fletcher Cox is owed like $63 million guaranteed next year. I'm sure that'll be restructured, excuse me, restructured some way, you know, how we can at least pull that rabbit out of the hat. Yeah. As far as. We- magic with the salary cap and stuff yeah it's gonna again it, yeah. who's it i mean that our our cap hit come next year it's it, he's gonna have to make a lot of things happen come next year i don't know how he's gonna be able to do it but hopefully he'll be able to do it but it's gonna be extremely extremely tough i mean another question is you got the rumor about zach Ertz turning down an extension back during the season and Dallas Goddard's a free agent after this year. So yep. it's a lot of question marks there. Oh, yeah. Do you bring right. back, you know, do you keep Zach Ertz and you know, re-up Dallas Goddard? Or do you trade Zach Ertz? Exactly. But, you know, if, again, with everything else that we've been talking about, you also take a look as well when going back to the Redskins and the nonsense that went on, Josh Norman – and DJ both put out tweets this week with the fallout that we were hearing about that was that was going to happen. And the Washington Post, of course, came out with an article uh, with Emily Applegate of how the organization has been. And if, if I remember correctly, the dates are going back as far as 2004 until last year. Now, Dan Snyder decided that he wanted to go ahead and, you know, change the culture, if you will. But he's putting almost like the onus. If you listen to some of the things that he said, on Ron Rivera. This happened before Ron. So I don't think he kind of understands that when you're saying that, you know, we're, well, Ron's going to come here and change the culture. Right. You're talking about the football culture of anything. He's not responsible what goes on in the front office or anything else. That's something that you have to do as owners. So don't put the onus on Ron Rivera saying that, well, by the way, here's what's going to, you're going to have to somehow know straighten this one out. So I don't know. It's, it's interesting. But if you, if you take a look earlier again this week, Josh Norman had put out a tweet. And basically what he was saying, what comes around goes around. Don't ask him any questions because uh, if I can read it here, it was a don't ask me any questions, but I will say this. What goes around comes around. What's done in the dark surely will come to the light. God seems to always have a way of repositioning his people at the right time or real truth without saying a single word. So that one is pretty big. And I guess he was, I guess, fairly disgusted of, and, and again, the entire story's not out there, but he did not like whatsoever what was going on with the organization. And it's it wasn't, again, just not him alone because you got, you know, DJ. And DJ said, so let's re- set the record straight on why and how things went south for me in Washington. And along with that, this is because what ended up happening was with Gruden, there was a uh, – one of the games that got blown out was like 40 to 16. And he had a post-game conference interview. Well, apparently – Gruden thought that he was saying something about him only come to find out that he wasn't talking about the coach. So the coach called him out. Like there was, there's tweets. And, and if anybody look, you know, wants to look it up, you can you know bring up the article, but Nick Schwartz did it, the, the column on DJ. And it shows how the tweets went on with Jay Gruden. Basically it was almost like he wanted a school fight, but DJ took the higher road and the same thing. He's basically saying that this organization, the way they treat women, it's all going to come out in the same way the coaches had treated the players. So, I mean, Washington has a lot to fix within the organization. Sounds like it. I mean, Sorry. just feel bad for a guy, who, you know, with the caliber of Ron Rivera. Like, what the heck did he walk in, though? Yeah. No inclination of it. Just sure he's sorry he took that job now. I know I would be. Uh, yeah, I, I think for for me, I think it's the same way too. I think you're. It, it's tough to you you want to come in obviously because you want to again. Ron wants to prove himself for what he couldn't do in Carolina. You know, two times is trying to win a Super Bowl. He can possibly do it in the NFC East because Lord knows that you know you're coming to a tough division. And I know people are going to say that we haven't been tough in years, but either way you look at it, it's it's a tough division to win. 
he's going to come here and he's going to be explosive. The same way with Mike McCarthy trying to be explosive in Dallas. There's a longer road for the Redskins that there is with McCarthy and the Cowboys or whatever the Redskins call themselves these days. But that's going to be a longer road to deal with. And there's going to be a lot of internal healing that they're going to have to take care of before they even think of what they can do with this organization as a whole. You know, Dan, apparently he hired his own lawyer to come into the firm and do an investigation. And then depending on the recommendations, he would say that, we you know, what's right and what's wrong. But why don't you let an independent firm come in there that maybe, you know, it has nothing to do as far as with the NFL putting their hands involved in it. So because to me, it's always one of those things. Like if you hire a firm, you're going to tell us what they want to hear because it's just the way it works. You know, Emily will probably be heard as far as what she has to say. And again, all this stuff will come out, you know, over time. So it'll make it even more interesting as the season goes along. But for what she had to say right now, for her to be disgusted, not to be with the organization, not to even stay in, in, in sports altogether, it bothered her so much. And I guess the other 14 ladies that are still within, they're in other teams, but they don't want to come forward because they, they believe that they will be hurt in the video that was made by the Washington Post that they would be hurt by coming forward and saying what they had to say about the organization. But me personally, I think Dan Snyder is, he's been there 10 years too long. He's done absolutely nothing with his organization. It, it, it's been stagnant for years. Oh, and yeah. The Redskins had been just as much as a joke. And again, no offense to the Browns, but the same thing. It, you know, the only thing is the difference is that the Browns don't have front office issues. They got player issues, but it's better to have player issues that you can solve rather than, you know, degrading women. I don't think, the, I mean, not to shift gears, but as far as the Browns, it just can't seem to keep a head coach. It's like, it's like a revolving door. Yeah, unfortunately. Redskins, it's like, as an Eagles fan, you don't want to see Dan Snyder sell that team. I mean, the guy's a moron. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's a joke. Like, just, you know, just the, the team's just – like a doormat or has been since he bought it. Yeah. So true. Well, we're, we're almost here to the finish line. We take a look and we have, of course, two more uh, concerns that we have to deal with, which would be that again, baseball season being it right around the corner. And we're hoping that once again, we will see opening day for the Phillies, the home opener, you're looking at July 24th, 7.05 starting. It's going to be against the Marlins. So you got three game stand at home with the Marlins. And then the interesting one is with the Yankees. So you have a home at home series. So you start in Philly for two games. Then you hit the road to New York for two games as well. The big one at the end there, we're looking at it. You have, again, where Toronto has no idea where they're going to play, where they're going to be, but those games are yet to be determined. So it's going to be, I guess, fun and interesting to see this. Tonight, of course, the Phillies play, what, the Orioles at home, I believe? Six o'clock. Yeah, so the game should be underway just about, close enough. So it, it, it's going to be different. I, I will say that much. For for every team, every organization, this is going to be the weirdest, latest opening day. But right. the schedule for the Phillies, if, if you look at it overall, not too bad for the Phillies. I mean, you, you play the end of the American League East and the National League East, and you know the Yankees, the Red Sox. You know, we're going to be some challenging games. I mean, the Braves, especially yeah. the Nationals, coming off the World Series, you know, winning it last year. I don't really know what's going to happen because, you know, hopefully everybody will stay healthy, but. You know, you lose a Bryce Harper. You know, you lose an Aaron Nola for, I don't know how they're working in as far as, you know, the injured list, like with COVID-19. But the good thing is, I guess, you know, a lot of these guys will be being able to uh, desi- be the designated hitter. Yeah. Or guys may not have to play the field every day. So could be very true. Well, the last thing that we'll wrap up here with, of course, we have – one more team, of course, a Philly team to deal with, and that would be, of course, our homegrown Flyers. The Flyers will be back. The, again, another team that you're looking at that's starting off at a, at a later time, but it's interesting how this one's going to play out too because so the season starts with 
a three-game round robin. You have the Boston Bruins, August 2nd, and of course, these games, even though it'll be at Boston, but we all know that they're going to be played in Toronto. So Scotiabank Arena will be the home team for the eastern side of the division. And then, of course, you have the western side that will be Montreal, if I remember correctly, where they, or Winnipeg, one or two. I know I'll get to it by the next, the, the next podcast. I want to bring it up. But you take a look, you got the Bruins, the Caps, and the Lightning. Now, prior to, of course, the season – stopping because of COVID-19, the interesting thing was that the Flyers, with their first-year head coach, were making so much leeway. It was ridiculous. Along with the Lightning, they started getting hot as well. And another team that I don't have up here is the Chicago Blackhawks. The Blackhawks started making moves. And I mean significant games where they were coming from behind from to win. So this schedule of the three games, and that's the only one so far that I see in August, because then after this, we'll define on how they're going to set up the matchups for the playoffs. But it, it's three games that are kind of evenly spaced apart, so the guys can get their legs back in between. I think that the, between the first and second game, you're looking at four days, and then after that, you got a three-game stint in between. I believe the Flyers, just me personally, I think the Flyers, as long as they do well in the first round, which obviously they would have to do so to get in the second round. But I, I think the Flyers, I'm looking at at least the second round of the playoffs. I wouldn't write them out in the first round, but I will at least see them in the second round of the playoffs. Well, before the pandemic kicked in, I mean, the Flyers were on fire. They were probably definitely one of the hottest teams in the NHL, you know, before they suspended you know, the NHL season. Like you said, the round robin here is going to be very interesting. Yeah, that is. I mean, it, again, we, we don't know what's going to end up happening. There's a lot of unknowns, and I'm pretty sure when we come back for our next episode here, we'll find out more stuff as as we all are. You know, whether it being you work for ESPN and the NFL Network or CBS, what whomever you work for, they get the same information the way that we do. It gets plugged in little by little, and and everything changes every single day, just like the school system. So. It's right. going to be interesting how this whole entire season is going to play out. But, Mike, thank you so much for coming on. I really do appreciate thank it. You know, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Not a problem whatsoever. We'll be doing it again probably still in about two weeks because, for me, I'll be taking a mini vacation in between uh, this podcast and the next one. But uh, probably long overdue. It's been about 21 years since the last time I went on vacation. So it's probably just a little bit long overdue. All right. Well, enjoy your vacation. Be safe and have a great time. Thank you. I appreciate it. So I'm going to say at least goodbye to you for the moment. And I'll talk to you a little bit later on. But thank you so much for coming on board. Thank you for being a co-host. And we'll do it again in about two weeks. Okay. Thank you for having me. Appreciate Not a problem. It. Have a good night. All right. So that's it for as far as the podcast, folks. Thank you for tuning in. If you did tune in, I did see one at least one person in there. But as the season comes along, we will try to get a little bit better on it. And we'll see how – Things will end up working, but I do appreciate the long, patiently waiting, wait for it. And obviously, if you want to catch a rebroadcast again, tune into the Facebook page and you'll be able to see the rebroadcast. So thank you guys so much. I really do appreciate it. Uh, tune in the next time. Everybody have a great week and please stay safe.